start our last uh, proposition. Every uh, one of our, uh, of our conferences, we've always had one of our debates on military issues, and this time we have decided uh, to choose one uh, that pertains to, uh, to the South China Sea. And uh, the idea uh, really came to me uh, when I was reading the testimony that was uh, presented by Admiral Davidson in April of 2018 to the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, and it was in written testimony uh, that he asserted that once China deploys its military assets on the man-made islands in the South China Sea, the PLA would be able easily to overwhelm the military forces of any other South China Sea claimant and would also be able to challenge the United States. In short, he stated, China is now capable of controlling the South China Sea in all scenarios short of war with the United States. Now, my understanding is that this was an assertion that had previously been made um, at least uh, close to that. I don't know if the wording was exactly the same uh, by his predecessor, Admiral Harry Harris. So if you'd all take out your clickers um, and one last time uh, vote um, either uh, for or against the proposition that China has the capability to control the South China Sea in all scenarios short of war with the United States. And there, there's many uh, aspects of that that we can dig into. All scenarios short of war and uh, control is, of course, uh, another question. And I know both of our speakers are likely uh, to, uh, to discuss those issues. Um, this has really sparked, I think, discussion and debate uh, among experts in the field. Does the PLA have uh, effective control over the airspace, over sea in the South China Sea in peacetime in all uh, contingencies. So we're very pleased to have with us two eminent scholars to debate this proposition. Uh, to my right, we have Mr. Brian Clark, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. And to my left, uh, we have Professor Peter Dutton, who is a professor and director of the China Maritime Studies Institute at the US Naval War College. And I know that both of these gentlemen have really thought a great deal about the challenges that we face in uh, the South China Sea. So I think this is really going to be a terrific discussion. Um, we have now, uh, yeah, we're just a little over 100 people. I know there's more than 100 people in the room, so we're going to give you a few more seconds if you want to add your vote. So far, we have 54% uh, in favor and 42% against. We've now gone to 55% in favor. Anybody, 54. Anybody else that <laughs> somebody keeps changing their mind? Uh, we, we still have people who feel that they want to create a, a C or D option. Um, we're not allowing undecided. Um, I hope that you will take a stand. Uh, okay, so um, we are going to, to it keeps moving. Um, okay, um, we are going to lock down the vote at this point, and we will, of course, vote again uh, at the end of the debate. Um, each of our speakers will have 15 minutes and then five minutes for rebuttal. And uh, once again, we'll start out with the person who is arguing in favor. So over to you, Brian. Well, thank you, Bonnie. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak here and uh, to a great group and a lot of people that I've worked with before. And it's great to see you all today. Um, I also am thankful for the opportunity to just follow on with what Admiral Davidson said, so it makes it very easy for my case mm -hmm. to argue for the proposition. Um, and also, it seems like everybody agrees with me. So um, given that everybody agrees with me and Admiral Davidson agrees with me, um, let me proceed. Uh, the, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the idea of control and what control means uh, in the course of this. But uh, fundamentally, I'm going to argue that China has uh, the ability to control the South China Sea because it's established escalation dominance in that area. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean by that and how that relates to uh, US options and allied options to conduct operations or push back on, on China aggression in the South China Sea. But there's really four main points to how it's established this escalation dominance. Uh, it's uh, the, co the comprehensive portfolio of capabilities that it's developed and fielded um, are part of that. I'll talk about that a little bit more. 
uh, to the, uh, the ability of the unified control over which uh, that, that uh, the Chinese military commission has exerted over this portfolio of capabilities. So they've unified a lot of civilian and military uh, capabilities and operations that traditionally would be separate in other militaries. They've unified those, that's the second point. Uh, the third point is, as the home team, you know, China enjoys some kind of basic advantages in geography and also in terms of where capabilities are based. Uh, and then fourth, the U.S. has played a part in this by not developing the sorts of uh, capabilities and policies that would enable it to more effectively uh, push back on Chinese assertiveness and aggression in the South China Sea. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into that in a little more detail. So first, when it comes to the comprehensive portfolio capabilities, uh, China, uh, just to kind of go through a little bit of the, the basics in terms of the numbers and, and the kinds of uh, maritime systems that the Chinese have, is uh, China now has the world's largest navy. It has a navy of more than 300 ships. Uh, and uh, we can talk a little bit about what those ships uh, consist of. I'm sure Peter, Peter will address that. Uh, but if you want to be able to conduct sea control in a region, having a big navy is a valuable part of that. Um, China is able to focus the attention of that navy on near seas to an extent that its competitors like the United States cannot. We've got a global uh, responsibility, a global navy, whereas China's got the luxury of maybe focusing more of its attention on the near seas, including the South China Sea. If you look at that navy uh, up close, um, Arguably, the Navy, despite China's uh, assertiveness, assertive assertions about its uh, far seas uh, aspirations, their Navy is really focused on near seas operations, even the newer parts of it. The newer ships are devoted more to sea control missions in a coastal environment than they are in power projection in an overseas environment. Uh, and I can talk about more details of that during the Q&A. But really, uh, it's got a much smaller proportion of uh, large surface combatants than the US Navy that would be designed for overseas operations. It's got much fewer number of uh, vertical launch system cells than the US Navy does, and it's got um, a smaller number of nuclear submarines that would be more designed for uh, overseas operations. So the Chinese Navy is very, very much designed for a uh, near seas uh, operations like you would see in the South China Sea. So the second part of the, of the Chinese maritime capability portfolio is the, is the uh, Coast Guard. So it's got the world's largest Coast Guard. Uh, again, it's able to devote a lot of the attention of that Coast Guard to the near seas like the South China Sea. Um, of its Coast Guard of more than 1,000 ships, a couple hundred of those are able to operate throughout the South China Sea. Uh, of those, only about a dozen are able to actually deploy out overseas. So really, they are focused very much on the East and South China Seas. Uh, probably the most important part of the, the maritime capability portfolio is the, is the maritime militia, which we've heard a lot of discussion about. So thousands of ships that have been brought into service uh, to support um, the uh, Chinese uh, operations in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. They routinely harass and, and uh, interfere with uh, those ships of the United States Navy and those of other navies. Um, some of those ships are actually uh, also full-time maritime militia ships and, and armed in a way that might be more consistent with the Coast Guard, uh, but it gives it the Chinese a, a capability that uh, is not really uh, mirrored on the other side by the, the US. Uh, the islands in the South China Sea, as you can see there, um, I think that's Fiery Cross. Um, can't remember, Fiery Cross or one of the others. But anyway, so there's multiple islands in the South China Sea uh, that are now built up, armed, able to support air operations, give the ability of the Chinese to control uh, surveil, monitor, and conduct air defense in parts of the South China Sea persistently without having to deploy ships there. Um, with the addition of potentially Scarborough Shoal in the future, arguably the Chinese could have a terrestrial based surveillance and air defense network that might allow them to establish an ADIS over the air defense identification zone over the South China Sea. Um, and arguably the ability to control the air is a key part of controlling the seas. So the ability of the Chinese to exert air control from these islands as well as from their ships is a key key component of their ability to control the South China Sea. And I'd say the last part of the capability portfolio is the surveillance network the, uh, that, that under, underpins their maritime capabilities. So the ability to basically look and find objects in the South China Sea at will and target them uh, for attack either by mainland-based missile systems, which is part of this portfolio as well, um, or by ships at sea um, is an is a element that um, is, can't be discounted. A key part of this surveillance network is the fact that it operates from largely the sanctuary of the Chinese mainland or from space, where it's more difficult for the U.S. to exert, you know, conduct operations to defeat Chinese uh, ISR capabilities.
So let's say kind of that first, that, that first very robust uh, capability portfolio that the Chinese have that they're able to devote to a, to a degree that the U.S. can't devote its capabilities uh, in the South China Sea. So the second part uh, of the, of the uh, Chinese approach that's uh, been useful is the fact that they've unified the control, the management, the command and control of these capabilities uh, essentially under the Central Military Commission. So by taking all of their civilian, uh, military, paramilitary, maritime capabilities and putting them all under the management of a central organization, they're able to use them um, as, as tools for different occasions to either dial up or dial down the level of escalation. This central control has allowed them to finally calibrate their operations in the South China Sea to allow them to uh, conduct uh, operations without uh, providing a pretext for U.S. escalation. Um, this gets to the idea that they've established escalation dominance in the South China Sea. So at the lower rung of the escalation ladder, the Chinese can use their maritime militia, as they do today, to routinely interfere with or hinder the movement of U.S. ships and J Japanese and other Navy's ships in the South China Sea. They can harass um, and in some cases try to intimidate uh, fishermen, uh, prevent them from accessing areas that the Chinese don't want them to access, like Scarborough Shoal. They can um, and have harassed uh, civilian U.S. Navy ships and prevented them from effectively operating in the region without a lot of opportunity on the U.S. side to respond because, again, it's a, it's a low, uh, low level of escalation that these, sh these uh, maritime militia provide. But because they're controlled centrally by the uh, Central Military Commission and the, the Command and Control Network, they're able to be used as a tool of that low level of escalation. And at the same time, there's other tools available over the horizon that can be brought in if necessary to uh, prevent the U.S. from being able to uh, escalate the situation effectively. Um, so if you're a U.S. ship trying to push back on uh, Chinese harassment, you got to know that over the horizon there's potentially a Chinese Coast Guard or a PLAN ship that's able to then uh, you know, raise the ante, if you will, uh, and keep you uh, in check. The, um, so the, the idea of these uh, militias activities are intended to increase the cost and increase the, the uh, level of difficulty of operating in the South China Sea, hopefully to the point where the U.S. Navy stops operating there nearly as much as it does today. Um, establishing a new normal um, and habituating their neighbors to the fact that this is the way that, that things are, is that if you're going to operate in the South China Sea, the tax you got to pay is dealing with this constant harassment. Or you operate you know, places that the Chinese want you to operate and essentially get their permission. As we step up the escalation ladder, then you've got the Chinese Coast Guard that can step in to conduct operations, and you can go up from there to the PLAN being able to conduct operations against uh, opposing naval forces. Um, but finally calibrating that so that they're staying just one step above what their opponent is willing to exert in terms of escalation. Um, that keeps the U.S. from necessarily having the pretext to come in with its capabilities to uh, exert maritime control. So, and that's really important because right now at the U.S. wants to exert sea control in the South China Sea, it has to do it with a very large, uh, robust force package that's able to defend itself, which would be unduly escalatory to respond to a gray zone altercation with uh, a, a Chinese uh, maritime militia ship and a USNS surveillance ship, for example. So the fact that the U.S. doesn't have options except big ones uh, helps give the uh, Chinese escalation dominance in the South China Sea. Uh, and then uh, the third point I want to make is the, the idea that China as the home team has certain advantages. Uh, that's not just proximity. It's not just the fact that because they're there and, and uh, bordering the South China Sea, it's easier for them to maintain this maritime militia. That's obviously a component of it. But more fundamentally, because they are the home team, they're able to uh, base most of their capabilities that they need for um, the higher levels of escalation in their home territory, making it raising the bar that much further for a U.S. response. So if the US just wanted to respond to a provocation in the South China Sea, you have to send in forces that are able to defend themselves from the uh, Chinese attack from forces at sea as well as ashore, or it's going to have to degrade those capabilities ashore or in space, which again causes the U.S. to have to uh, escalate more than it's probably willing to do uh, to respond to a gray zone provocation. And so the fourth uh, area there is that basically what the U.S. has done. So the U.S. has been a willing partner in the, the China, Chinese ability to control the South China Sea. And by that I mean uh, the U.S. has not developed the uh, small scale or low intensity response capabilities that it would need to be able to proportionally uh, react to Chinese propagations in the South China Sea. It has not invested in the kind of uh, small scale naval forces. 
It's not invest in the kind of non-kinetic capabilities like high-power microwave or electronic warfare in the way that you would need to to be able to operate those in the South China Sea. It also hasn't established the policies that would enable, enable these non-kinetic capabilities to be used in an environment like the South China Sea in a situation short of war. Because for the US, electronic warfare is considered an offensive capability, whereas for the Chinese, it's considered a defensive capability. And for their homeland defense purposes, they routinely use electronic warfare against US and allied ships operating in the East and South China Seas. Uh, the other part of it is when we, for the, those small scale forces we do have, uh, we're unwilling to use them because they aren't able to defend themselves against uh, the ability of the Chinese to escalate just a slight level above the current level of uh, provocation. So for example, um, you know, we have the uh, US impeccable being harassed by militia ships that then turns into a Coast Guard altercation or perhaps a PLAN altercation and a couple of ships come along to harass the impeccable as well. If we want to respond to that, we're going to have to bring in a large uh, carrier strike group or a large surface action group that's able to defend itself from the potential attack that it might receive from missiles based on the Chinese mainland. Because uh, the alternative would be to degrade those missiles on the Chinese mainland, which would be even more, prob even more escalatory. So we roll in with a very large force package that's able to defend itself in this environment, and now we're the provocateur, we're the aggressor, as opposed to the, the Chinese that initially started the altercation. So the fact that we have not developed the ability to defend ourselves at small scales, and the fact that we have not invested in the capabilities to uh, conduct proportional responses, have both made the US a willing partner in this ability of China to control the South China Sea. So those are my four points about why we, uh, we have lost the ability to control the South China Sea to the Chinese. Thank you. Well, I see I have an uphill battle to start because the numbers were against me to begin with. And I also feel that uh, my colleague has used my institute's information against me, um, <laughs> which, which Andrew Erickson, Ryan Martinson, Connor Kennedy, and Lyle Goldstein have done a great job to, to, to do. But that's the, but the problem is that's actually not our premise. That's the problem. Um, and nor do I actually challenge, nor do I challenge, um, the previous statement uh, that was in the, the testimony, which is that if the islands become militarized, it becomes very problematic for the other claimants and for the United States, at least for a period of time as well. Again, not our premise. What is our premise today? It is the statement before us is China has the capability to control the South China Sea in all scenarios short of war with the United States. Okay. In order to demonstrate that this statement's inaccurate, I'll break it down into three things. First, can China control can China achieve sea control without conflict? Second, could China achieve sea control through war with a regional state? And third, how must great power politics factor into Chinese calculations? First, can China achieve sea control without conflict? Sea control is always a local matter. To achieve full sea control over a body more than 1.3 million square miles in size is not a local matter. Indeed, any time we talk about sea control, um, there are three, always, always three factors that we have to consider. Um, if we systematically break down the concept uh, into these three factors, we can see that the premise that China has the capability to control the South China Sea in all circumstances, short of war with the United States, is dubious. The first factor to consider is degree. That is to say, degree of control, how much control. Is mutual denial sufficient? Is mutual operation at acceptable risk sufficient? Or is total freedom of action for one side and total denial to your opponent required? In this case, the premise of the statement suggests that China has the capability to achieve whatever degree of control it wants at any time in any part of the South China Sea or all of it without war. This leads to the second factor in understanding sea control, which is location. It's related to de degree of control, so we should look at the two together. For some measure of comparison, the South China Sea, as I mentioned, is 1.351 million square miles in size, not including the Gulf of Thailand. The Mediterranean is, is just under a million square miles as by way of comparison. So the South China Sea is about uh, uh, 1.4 times the size of the Mediterranean. It's a very large body of water. To patrol this vast space, China has 125 Coast Guard vessels, over 1,000 tons. I checked yesterday with Ryan Martinson. <laughs> and 84 maritime militia um, operating out of Sancho City. 
That's the professional maritime militia that really can exercise control in the, in the way uh, Brian has mentioned. That's 209 vessels, not including the Navy, and since we're talking about circumstances short of war, it seems reasonable to exclude the, the Chinese Navy in this case. That's one vessel for every 6,464 square miles. Even if we say there are a few hundred additional part-time militia vessels that might have the capacity to meaningfully support complex sea control operations on a sustained basis, which I doubt, that might make the total of 500 vessels, reducing the problem to uh, one vessel for every 2,702 square miles. And that's hardly what I would call sea control, even with superior uh, uh, air control and superior information control. It's got to be done on the sea in the end. So even with all that capacity, it's a difficult problem to achieve localized Sea control, and that's really what sea control is about. China's gray zone tactics have had a very hard time achieving sea control, even over a very limited space against a determined adversary. Chinese law enforcement officers pointed out that in the rights protection struggle, as they call it, it is much easier to attack than to defend. When defending your own use of the sea, the opponent has the initiative. To physically block him from obstructing your operations, the Chinese learn they need three or four vessels for every one of the adversaries. This they learned from having to defend the operations of the oil rig, uh, Haiyang Shoyo 981, when it operated off the paracels against Vietnamese resistance. This brings us to the third sea control factor, and that's time. How long does sea control have to be maintained? It's always a, a challenge to sustain sea control over the long term. The Chinese learned that to create sea control over, and remember we're talking below the threshold of conflict now. So the Chinese learned that to create sea control over a very limited time around the operations of one drilling rig was a huge effort that they could not have sustained indefinitely. And the, and the events took place in the parasols close to the mainland, the Chinese mainland, and to its bases of logistical support. Imagine the additional challenges for Chinese operations across longer lines of operation. So unilateral gas and oil and, uh, development is hard to do against determined opposition. That in part explains why China has not done it yet in the South China Sea. If the Chinese cannot confidently control contested spaces to explore and exploit hydrocarbons, then they do not have sea control. It is also important to note that Vietnamese fishermen are still operating around the paracels. The Chinese have never been entirely successful at driving them out with non-military forces since they took the islands in 1974. It's therefore critical to consider the role of will of a determined adversary as perhaps the critical factor in preventing China from having the capability to control the South China Sea. While we're on the topic of control and circumstances short of armed conflict, there is one more consideration I'd like to raise. That is the deterrent and disruptive role of technology. Over time, those with an interest in preventing China from achieving sea control have an incentive to employ alternative or asymmetric technologies to disrupt Chinese efforts. Even now, there uh, is something to be said in this regard for the Vietnamese purchase of Kilo submarines. But if China did in fact seek to exert sea control over the South China Sea, it is reasonable to predict, to predict that Vietnam and others would seek to acquire the sort of technologies that would make Beijing's task even more difficult than the factors of space, time, and force make the challenges already. And no doubt Vietnam would be aided by outside powers. Japan, India, the United States, and Australia have already been active in this regard. So as a matter of space, time, and force, political will, and technology, it is hard to accept the idea that China has now, or could have, the physical capacity to achieve sea control over the South China Sea without the use of military force. Now to the second question. Could China achieve sea control through war with a regional state? It's not the United States, but a regional state. Vietnam, again, is a key potential opponent in this scenario. They have the most skin in the game, the greatest ability of any of the claimants to resist, a great history of resisting major powers, need I remind us, um, and the determination to do so again if necessary. In case we, ne we need a reminder of Vietnamese ten tenacity, I return to the point that the Vietnamese fishermen are still operating around the paracels at great risk and against the odds they continue to show up because they are unwilling to cede their right to fish in these waters. And if China makes war against Vietnam or another regional state, it might be able to take and hold the Spratleys. I, I concede that point. But then what? China would, be able, China would be back in the position of having to play a cat and mouse game at sea or to defend the specific points at great cost and at great effort. 
Additionally, in considering war making against a regional state, the Chinese must always take into account the potential response of other states to such a conflict. America might have an interest, for instance, in taking advantage of the opportunity to involve itself in order to weaken China's naval capacity. This is a point I will return to in a moment, since it is not just the American response the Chinese must take into account. The role of other regional states is key. Would Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, or Australia stand by if Vietnam is attacked? These states, like all states, have been willing to acquire largesse through trade with China, but none wants to be dominated by China. And then China must consider the non, so China must consider the non-military costs of conflicts with regional states. Can China really manage those consequences? Uh, with other regional states who are likely to impose consequences if uh, there's conflict with one of them. China has enough economic challenges in attempting to raise its economy beyond the middle income trap and has staked its future on the Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese have stated that this initiative relies heavily on economic cooperation of Southeast Asian states as critical partners. In the end, it's the health and future of the Chinese common, common economy that is the single most important factor in determining the future uh, of the Chinese economy and, and the Chinese uh, Communist Party. China is in a very different position than it was in 1962 and 1979 when it last waged wars. It's now much more economically integrated and therefore much more economically dependent on trade and trade relations with other countries. If China were to seek to dominate the South China Sea through a war with, with a regional state, it would have to dominate the surrounding states as well. And the geography of the South China Sea is not the geography of the Baltic or the Black Sea. The South China Sea is geographically porous. To dominate it would require control over the actions of the bordering states as well. And war against one or more regional states to achieve this measure of control would rightly be perceived as a bid for hegemony and resisted as such. This leads to the final question. How must great power politics factor into Chinese calculations? I accept as a given, again, that China has the military capability to target almost anything in the South China Sea. But I maintain the Chinese cannot re realistically prevent other states from continuing economic and security activities there without an escalation that is politically much further than Beijing would want to go. The American security role in, this, in Southeast Asia and in the South China Sea is critical to ensuring the risk of escalation and the cost of involving the United States and other regional states in the conflict would be too much to bear. In my view, the best way to conceptualize the value of the American naval presence in the South China Sea is as a corollary to the American armed forces stationed in Western Europe during the Cold War. The physical presence of the American army divisions in Germany served to deter Soviet advances beyond Eastern Europe and to reassure our NATO allies of the American commitment to the freedom of Western Europe. Those divisions were placed in Germany even in the face of acknowledged Soviet conventional superiority on the ground. That is to say, American forces were held at risk to deter war between the Soviets and Western Europeans because the Soviets knew war would involve the Americans. Similarly, the active, robust presence of the American Navy in the South China Sea, even when held at risk by Chinese weapon systems, serves the same purpose. The concept of any region, be it maritime or territorial, that is free from domination necessarily must be ensured by this balance of forces between great powers. And as tempting as it may be to move from this truth to an assessment of relative conventional military capability, in most historical cases of a contested commons, the overarching factor has been the response of the international system. If China were to take, seek to take control of the South China Sea through a regional conflict, I am convinced other states would not remain neutral. For the risk of remaining neutral would almost certainly be to succumb to Chinese hegemony in the South China Sea and Southeast Asia. And for any who might be tempted to think the South China Sea and Southeast Asia are not strategically important to the United States, perhaps a few more statistics will convince you otherwise. U.S. trade with the South China Sea littoral states in 2017, based on combined imports and exports, as reported by the U.S. Census Bureau, was $246.9 billion. That's more than the U.S. bilateral trade with Japan, or Korea, or Taiwan, or Hong Kong. True, our bilateral trade with China was $635 billion in 2017, but our government has already demonstrated its willingness to sacrifice our trade with China in the interest of achieving our strategic goals. 
It is a fundamental truth that as abundant as our continental wealth may be, American strength comes from our robust global, global trade and our leadership in the system that supports it. If China believes it can or should attempt to control the South China Sea through conflict with a regional state, it must take into account the very salient fact across American history that free access to trade has been deemed a vital interest worth protecting by force if necessary. In conclusion, China cannot control the South China Sea in circumstances short of war as a simple matter of space, time, force, political will, and the likely trends in technology. Additionally, I maintain that to attempt to control the South China Sea through war with a regional state would draw in other states and would risk both Beijing's investment in its navy and other forces and the economy that sustains the CCP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent, um, but wrong. The, um, <laughs> so uh, I think though uh, Peter brings up a great point about what constitutes control or sea control in this case. Uh, you know, I didn't try to define it up front because I thought we'd get into this discussion here. Uh, but if, if we think about sea control as being, I can you know create a, essentially a fence around the South China Sea and I can decide who comes and who goes, and I can eliminate anybody that's in there when I want to. Right, that's a, that's a difficult proposition for any country to try to maintain that level of control over an area, over a body, body of water. But if we think of sea control as the ability to, at will, prevent uh, a, an opponent or anybody else from effectively using those waters, that might be a little bit different situation then. Um, and that's what I think is a, the more important definition for sea control in the South China Sea. If in situations short of war, uh, if the Chinese are able to prevent the U.S. Navy, the Ch Japanese Navy, the navies of the Philippines and its neighbors from uh, effectively conducting military operations in that area by harassment, by inter intimidation, by interference, uh, by threatening uh, escalatory attacks that are maybe just one level above what is being currently conducted there, that's a way of preventing those, those forces from operating effectively. You can also prevent the fishing and merchant vessels from operating effectively in the South China Sea without going to war, and the, they certainly have the capabilities to do that. So I think this idea of control as being only the ability to prevent access and eliminate those forces that are there is too high a bar to think of, and I think we could find ourselves in a situation where we lose effectively lose control um, because we um, are un unwilling or unable to conduct military operations under the threat of escalatory attacks and the, the constant presence of uh, interfering forces there. I think will is a very important aspect of this, you know, like Peter brought up, is uh, the will of the Chinese to, as we've seen demonstrated, continue to ratchet up the level of escalation or ratchet it down and stay in one level basically above that of their opponent uh, is something that we need to take into account. And I don't think the U.S. has shown the willingness to do the same thing to China. We have not shown the willingness and certainly don't have the capability to go one level up in, esca in escalation in response to a Chinese provocation, and nor have we. And um, I think that's going to continue. And so the argument that, well, we'll just send in our forces and they will continue to operate either at risk um, or um, in a highly provocative manner because they've operated, they, they go in with a large force package that can defend itself, means that you know, we, we are left with two options that we've shown no willingness to exert. So I think will is an important thing. I think the Chinese have shown the will to continue to ratchet up the level of escalation in a calibrated way, and we have not shown the will to, do, to respond effectively. And the idea of the U.S. presence there um, being like the presence of U.S. forces in the Cold War uh, in Europe is an interesting parallel. Uh, during the Cold War, those U.S. forces were expected to be at risk and were probably going to suffer some losses, but they were expected to fight. The expectation is that they would you know, be the initial line of defense and that they would at least slow down the Soviet advance and through things like air land battle, we're going to be able to do follow-on forces attack and slow down the, the uh, Soviet invasion while peripheral operations you know, put some uh, punishment on the, on the Soviets in response. In the South China Sea, you don't, see, you don't have that same situation. We're not putting a force there or could put a force there that's robust enough to really uh, provide that same level of delay and degradation as we did in the fold of gap with our uh, ground forces during the Cold War. And the last point I would bring up is uh, war does not equal the use of mili any military force. 
So in situations short of war, you would expect, and we do see routinely, the use of military force and potentially shooting at each, each, each other um, as a way of uh, pressuring or intimidating or coercing the opponent into doing what you want to do. The Russians are doing this right now, you see, in the, in the Sea of Azaz, and the Chinese have done this many times in the past. So I think we don't want to equal war with the use of any military force. So the PLAN is certainly a capability the Chinese would use to continue to press their case and conduct sea control in the South China Sea. Um, they would certainly be expected to uh, shoulder, attack, shoot at US ships if they needed to, if they were able to calibrate that response so that it's not uh, unduly escalatory. That's my response. I'll just take it from here. Okay. Um, actually, I'm supposed to turn this off, aren't I? There we are. Um, so the problem with this approach um, is it focuses too much. It, it, it goes directly to the military instrument as opposed to um, recognizing, I think, that um, short of war with the United States, there's a tremendous amount of international politics that, um, in which there's also a tremendous amount of leverage, not just American leverage, but um, the regional states have leverage as well. And together, we all have leverage that, that, um, that actually, I, I'm not convinced China does have escalation dominance as, as a whole. I mean, in a tactical scenario, perhaps. I mean, they've got a lot of, a lot, a lot of tools to, to, to bring to bear. But in, in the aggregate, I'm not convinced that they do. The key about the balance of forces in the region isn't that um, the US and China even are likely to engage in a conflict in the region. There are certain scenarios you can imagine where we would. But the key about the balance of forces is that the United States does not have to dominate the South China Sea. We don't now, and nor do we need to. But we need to have sufficient force robustly employed to ensure that China does not dominate the South China Sea. Why? Because it's, that's the umbrella under which international politics occur and in which the other, the other states in the region do become free to pursue their own interests and their own objectives in the region. And I think what we're observing is the reality of it every day. There are, in fact, Vietnamese and Philippine and uh, Malaysian and Indonesian uh, fishermen out fishing every day, right? Um, and and uh, there's, there's, I mean, the Malaysians are still in undertaking uh, oil activities uh, inside the Nine Dash Line and, and against the preferences of China. Um, and, and so, so there, there is actually uh, uh, an, a whole reality out there uh, that China simply cannot control. Now, can it, can it seek to dominate small uh, local areas with its, with its forces? And we saw HY981, yes, it can at cost and in, with difficulty and for a short period of time. But that's not the same thing as what the premise requires, right? Which is the, in all scenarios, sort of conflict with the United States that China can uh, dominate the South China Sea, and the real important part of that is essentially to accept that premise is, is, is a sort of a defeatism. Um, the United States and the other uh, states in the region have tremendous tools at our disposal, and the reality on the ground is that we're using them every day, on the water, is that we're using them every day um, to ensure that the South China Sea remains an open part of, the, of not only the regional order, but the global order a free part where every, every state is free to, to pursue its interests and to engage in um, regional and international trade. That's the real key. Okay, great. I think we have had a really good discussion and some very sharp distinctions between uh, our speakers, so I sort of like that. Um, uh, we are gonna open it up to the floor and look to you to ask some pointed questions that will um, encourage our debaters to dig down even further and defend their arguments. Okay, so we'll start over here and we'll take three interventions and then we will come back to our speakers. Go ahead. I'm Peter Humphrey, Intel Analyst, former diplomat. It's hard for me to answer this question without knowing what the US rules of engagement are. If a Chinese ship shoots at an American plane, do we get to waste the ship? If they shoot down an American plane, do we get to waste the ship? If the plane takes off from an airstrip and shoots at an American plane, do we get to waste the airstrip or the entire island base? Without that, knowing what those contingencies are, it's really hard to answer that question. Okay, so part of that question is going to be, do the ROEs matter um, in the validity of this statement? So I saw a question back here, let's go somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. It's always it's the same people as asking questions. 
<laughs> All right, uh, we'll go back over here. Stan Weeks, you wanted to ask a question, and then we'll go back to uh, Wishin Vo in front. Thank you for some excellent presentations, uh, Stan Weeks, SAIC, and ex-US Navy. Uh, question regarding, for each of you, what you think as the Chinese capability that most worries you about being able to uh, control the South China Sea? Now or in the future? Existing capabilities or potential capabilities now in the future? Now or in the future. Now or in the future. Okay. All right. We were going to go to Wu Xinbo, and I'm sure we'll have time for another round. So uh, for those who I haven't called on yet. I don't think this um, proposition really catches the um, core of the South China Sea issue. Um, basically, there are three uh, uh, possibilities. One, of course, is the uh, so-called the um, sea control by China of the entire South China Sea, which in my opinion is neither possible nor uh, feasible uh, for China. And B, China will gradually gain uh, some relative uh, geopolitical advantage in this region vis-a-vis -vis other neighboring countries, which will be inevitable, uh, but which doesn't mean that China can you know, uh, uh, gain the sea control again of this uh, euro. The third issue is to prevent China um, and other disputed, uh, 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 disputants um, from coming into a military conflict. That means the South China Sea disputes being resolved by the use of military means. I think the third is really the core issue. And in that regard, I think that the US can encourage uh, diplomatic efforts by the related parties to negotiate, not only in code of conduct, but other uh, uh, means to promote cooperation and, uh, uh, and also uh, joint development. So I think that that's the third issue is really uh, a, a, a possibility that should be avoided. Why is this kind of sea control, I think, is too much uh, 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 overblown uh, uh, scenario, OK? OK, Comment well, I'm going to turn that into a question and ask whether um, having sea control uh, increases the risk of military conflict. Uh, so uh, we now have three questions. You want to start, Brian? Uh, sure. All right. So uh, thank you for those. So I think on the terms of the ROE, I don't think uh, the specific ROE that are in effect for a particular situation are as important to this question yep. as the will of uh, the U.S. Yep. to respond in general. So the ROE can always follow the will, but I would, uh, my argument is we've not really shown the, the will to uh, extend the kind of ROE that would yep. allow us to respond. And the Chinese have been very clever and careful and calibrated in how they've been you know, doing these prov provocations so that they're just uh, a little bit higher the level than what's already happening there. So the question is, are we going to respond in the way that we've got available to us, which is relatively robust, um, to what is a slight increase in the level of escalation on the part of the Chinese? Um, and I don't think we've demonstrated that we have that will. And, and I think, but I think you're, you know, the question about ROE kind of goes back to will, and it's, it's all about in the situations that you identified, would the U.S. have the will to respond? In some of those situations, I'd say, yeah, because it's just so you know, escalatory that the U.S. would both have the pretext and you know, would need to respond from a you know, national reputation standpoint. Um, in terms of the capabilities, I would say one capability that would be particularly concerning are um, China's use of ocean observatories to uh, conduct oceanographic research that might also be used to look for submarines. <laughs> uh, so the U.S. has put in talks openly about the fact that they're going to use submarines as kind of the ace in the hole for maintaining access to the South China Sea and East China Sea in time of war. That if the you know Chinese invest in ocean observatories to try to find those, it could start to degrade the ability of the U.S. to have that uh, option. Um, so that might be the to me the most concerning capability. And, and then the last one about uh, sea control and whether that is uh, in itself uh, likely to lead to war. I guess I would argue that no. I think at least if you think of sea control in terms of the ability to uh, prevent effective operations by your adversary or your opponent when you desire to that doesn't necessarily lead to war. Now, I think in terms of the way Peter defined it, you might. I mean, you're talking about something that's just so you know, uh, egregious that it might not be tenable to the adversary, so war might be inevitable. 
Um, well, I, I, first of all, I think we're in agreement on this point about will. Um, I, I've already talked about how um, I think will is uh, a critical component of, of, of the dynamic of the region. It's really a political dynamic. It's actually not a military dynamic in its first and foremost instance. The military component is a component of the larger strategic dynamic in the region. Um, and so, um, so I do think that the PRC use of force um, against a U.S. vessel would, uh, the American response is critical and it's got to demonstrate will. Um, so, <laughs> however, um, I, I, what I want to say is we keep jumping to this U.S.-China conflict. That's actually not the premise here, remember. And so I get it why we want to jump to the U.S.-China conflict, because, because the U.S. security presence does provide the umbrella under which other freedoms of action can take place, because it does, the, the U.S. umbrella does provide that escalation management, that check on it, on China's concern uh, about what might happen if it decides to, to try to um, uh, seek control over, over escalation in the region. I get that. But... Um, I, I return to this point about it's, it's not just tactical will, it's strategic will. And, and it's, the demo, it's exactly what we did in Europe in the Cold War. We put forces at risk and dared the Soviets to come through the Fulda Gap. Do you really want this war was the question that the Soviets had to answer for themselves. Just now replaced China with the Fulda Gap in the South China Sea. It's the same question. Do you really want this war? In, in some case, I don't really care how much intelligence and surveillance equipment you put in the South China Sea. Do you really want this war? And we demonstrate to the Chinese they don't want this war by remaining present and active and robust and engaging in the South China Sea and throughout it, continuing to do that the whole time. Second, the, it's a great question, what's the most worrisome capability? And because I think the military instrument's only one of the instruments at play here, I actually don't worry about any of the military technologies anywhere near as much as I worry about the Chinese economic relations with other countries. That's the, the tool I worry about the most. Because, because every single country on the planet, every one of them, including the United States, has to calculate between economic and security interests. Every one of them. So the one that I worry about the most, the tool that the Chinese can most effectively employ in the South China Sea is not a UUV or a drone or a militia or a destroyer. It's a contract. So, so that's what we need to be most focused on and most concerned about blunting in the South China Sea. And as for the use of, as for the use of uh, power in the South China Sea, power is most powerful when it's latent, not when it's employed. And so the Chinese actually have more power by not using their capability than they would have if they actually started to use it, for all the reasons that I've pointed out. So I think there are plenty of breaks on escalation, and we need to use power carefully. We, the United States, need to use it powerfully, actively, robustly, and essentially daring the Chinese to do something about it. All right, we prov provoked some more hands. We will take three more. Let's make them short. We'll go to Harlan Elman in front. <clears throat> right here. Uh, thank you. I'm Harlan Elman. Uh, this debate is reminiscent of deterrence. In many ways, will and sea control is largely theological. So let me see if we can become more specific. Um, is this the status quo? Well, where is China headed in next steps? And let me give you an example to stretch your thinking. Uh, the bridge, the Kerch Bridge from Russia to Crimea has been brilliant for strategic reasons because it's been so built that by blocking with a single ship, the Russians now exercise complete control of the Sea of Azov. And we're going to be very, very limited in terms of what we can do. Do you think the Chinese are thinking in that direction? And where might they take this in two or three or four years or is this about as far as you think they're going to go? Okay. Um, all right, Mike McDevitt. Terrific discussion. Um, regarding uh, Peter's fold a gap analogy, um, the other day I counted noses uh, in terms of the number of ships on a day-in and day-out basis in, uh, in, in uh, East Asia that China has 
in the United States have that can actually shoot something at you, a, a <laughs> torpedo or a cruise missile or launch an airplane. And, and so Peter was talking about putting forces at risk. The, the numbers are pretty startling. Uh, it's something like 270 Chinese ships who can shoot something at you. I'm not talking about a five-inch pop gun. I'm talking about a smart weapon or a torpedo versus 18. And so, um, in the Seventh Fleet. And so there is, there is an asymmetry in firepower. Uh, and they're definitely, they are definitely playing a home game. Mm -hmm. Or have home field advantage. Um, uh, the second point is about the, the sea lane itself and how much trade passes through there. Um, China, of course, has never interrupted commercial traffic. Uh, not surprisingly, since China, more than any other country, depends right. upon that sea lane. Yeah. Uh, but even if tomorrow morning uh, somebody put a picket fence, as Brian mentioned, around the South China Sea, uh, there are, you just go around it. And there are ways to go around it through the Lombok Straits and Makassar, et cetera, et cetera, to the point that, in other words, world trade would not stop. It would take a little bit longer to go to Asia, to Northeast Asia, a couple of days more, yeah. and what have you, but it would continue to go. And the analogy is when the Suez Canal was closed for seven years, what did commercial trade do? They just went around the coast, of, went all the way around the continent of Africa. And so uh, we need to kind of keep the South China Sea in a bit of perspective, I guess is what I would offer. I don't, there's no question in here, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Shame, shame, shame. All right. Things Jordan. to light on, though. I know. There are yep. definitely things to reflect, important points that you've made. And uh, OK, um, over here, this gentleman does not ask a question yet today. Thank you. Huang Haito from Nanka University, China. And uh, I don't like uh, the world here, the control, but I, I'd like to replace it with influence. Uh, if United States wants to say no to China for controlling or influence in all scenarios in South China Sea. So my question is, to what extent that you think United States will tolerate or to accept China's influence in South China Sea? Thank you. Maybe another proposition for another time, but yeah. if the debaters so want to talk about that, <laughs> it's just, yes, it's just taking us in a very, very different direction. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask this gentleman who's been very patient here to ask his question, and then we'll come back to our panelists. Uh, two questions, but very brief. One has to do with the Philippines. Both speakers talked about neighboring states and roles they play. But Philippines is headed by a president who called uh, American president, son of a bitch, and uh, Xi Jinping his friend. So what role uh, can that must possibly play in your analysis? And second is uh, how is this South China Sea control question relates to other areas of possible U.S.-China uh, conflict, that is Taiwan, Korea, mm -hmm. and also trade? All right, who wants to start? Peter, you want to start this time? Peter should start. Sure. Peter should start. OK. Um, so are you the Philippine ambassador? I'm, uh, the Philippines, Duarte president. No, are you the ambassador from the Philippines, or? Am I what? Uh, who, who are you? I'm sorry, I don't well, know. I, I have a One Korea Foundation. Ah, One Korea. OK, thank you. Sorry. Um, so uh, the question about deterrence. Um, you know, in the Kerch Bridge, uh, Kerch Strait in the bridge, I, I, I think, um, I mean, these are important questions and uh, they bear thinking through, but let's be clear, the South China Sea at 1.351 million square miles is not the Sea of Azov or the narrow strait that enters into it. It's a very porous region. There's a lot of ways in and out. And a lot of countries that surround it and, and uh, have, have interests that I think um, coincide with the vision that I've laid out about a free region supported by um, a robust American uh, presence. So I do think we, there are a lot more tools in, available, is, is my view. I think it's a good question. I think it's a really important thing to consider. But I also think we have a lot of tools and variables at our disposal. Um, Admiral McDevitt about um, commercial traffic. I, 
I agree. I mean, I don't think China's going to shut down commercial traffic through the South China Sea, or if it does, there are other ways around. I, I, I get that. The larger question, though, is not about traffic through the South China Sea or even, even uh, uh, you know, e e even uh, China's ability to shut it down for the commercial traffic re re uh, reasons. It's the question of doing so and the hegemonic intent that that demonstrates. That's number one. Number two, that's the reason I pointed out the, the value of bilateral trade to the United States with the that was only the Southeast Asian littoral states in the South China Sea, not all ASEAN states, just the littoral states in the South China Sea. The cost, so, so the, and the reason I pointed out that as robust as American uh, uh, wealth is on our continent, it's through trade that we generate real wealth that enables us to be a global power. And so access to trade is fundamentally important. And if China thinks it wants to become the, the hegemon in Southeast Asia, then the HY981 drilling rig is just the canary in the coal mine. Uh, what comes next is a, a regional economic policies that at the very least have to orient toward Beijing like a, a needle toward the North Pole. Beijing might not, might not control them, but they certainly would have a veto power over them. And so that's bad for the United States. And that's, what, that's why we have to care about whether the Chinese think about shutting down uh, uh, the South China Sea Strait for any region, or the South China Sea for any reason at all. And finally, um, this, the, the, the question about um, uh, Duterte and uh, the Philippines. Um, look, I mean, states are free to make political choices. And states are, you know, a state like the Philippines has another election coming. Um, so, you know, what, states' policies will, will, will come and go, but, but uh, I think even President Duterte, Duterte recognizes that it's not in the Philippines' interest to be dominated by China. And I don't think uh, the next government will feel any differently. Connection to Taiwan, Korea? There's anything you wanted to add about oh. that? I'll, I'll let my... Okay, we'll leave that to Brian. <laughs> okay, because it is connected. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll you know, talk about uh, South China Sea and, uh, and Korea and uh, you know, other areas, Taiwan and other areas of competition. I mean, I think you know, China clearly looks at U.S. fecklessness in the South China Sea as an uh, indicator of how the, Chi how the U.S. might respond if it were to initiate something more aggressive with regard to Taiwan. Um, and North Korea certainly views it when they look at what uh, they might do with uh, South Korea. And so I think that we, we can talk about you know, the, what Peter talks a lot about what the U.S. should do and, and will and how we should be acting, but not how we are acting. So if you look at how we are acting, Mike McDevitt brings up correctly that we've got a very small presence in the South China Sea, and it's not even relative to the Chinese Navy. It's just relative to the overall counter-maritime capability that the Chinese can bring to bear. It's a very small presence. It's not the fold a gap example. In the fold a gap example, uh, the, the Soviets legitimately thought there was a chance they may not win <laughs> if they invaded uh, the uh, Central Europe, um, partly because of U.S. forces being there. So the U.S. forces in Europe were not a tripwire that just brought the U.S. into the war. They were a capability that helped make sure that the, the Soviets realized they didn't have a free pass. The, the U.S. naval forces that are operating in uh, Western Pacific and in the South China Sea are not sufficient to create that level of uncertainty with the Chinese. So I don't know that there's a, a good parallel there. Um, the, uh, but China going into the future, I think, um, is likely to continue to press the case and look for ways to incrementally improve its position in the South China Sea towards this idea that it wants the ability to control, even if it's implied control, when they, you know, they can do it at will, but they don't do it day to day. Um, so you'll see continued uh, efforts to improve the capabilities on the islands they already have. You'll see efforts to turn Scarborough Shoal into another one of these islands with a radar installation there. They could establish an ADIS over the South China Sea, which may or may not be honored by other countries, but it's there. Um, and then you would probably see you know, more efforts to harass and intimidate those forces that come into the uh, South China Sea to try to habituate them to the fact that it's just going to be a hassle operating there. And you, if you're going to choose to do so, you're doing so at risk and in, in the face of you know, active opposition. But it gets to will. So certainly the U.S. could do a lot of things to change that, you know, that Peter argues. 
but I don't see any evidence that they're doing that thus far. So that's, that's why I would argue that the Chinese can exert sea control over the South China Sea in conditions lo less than war. The um, uh, role of the regional countries, I think that's a very interesting point, and Peter brought that up, you know, the multilateralization of this, trying to bring in other countries, using trade as an element of our pushback on this. Those are all tools that are available, and that may be opportunities there. The problem you run into is now you're, then you're dealing with something that's got lots of competing interests. The regional Southeast ASEAN, as we know, has a lot of competing interests in it. They don't all row in the same direction. They have different things they want, both from China and from the outside world. You've got countries like Vietnam that are act much more actively pushing back on China, and then countries like the Philippines that are less actively doing so, and Cambodia that are actively not doing so. So you've got... You know, within the regional countries, you've got enough of a of enough of a con disc dissonance that where uh, the Chinese can you know, and do take advantage of that, and so it's you know, unlikely that they're going to be able to mount a concerted effort to push back on China using other tools of of uh, national power. Yeah. Any final words? Yeah, just a couple of final words. Um, it's true. I'm not. I haven't always been a fan, and I'm publicly uh, on the record as not always a fan of the way um, the U.S. policy has carried, been carried out in the South China Sea. But I wouldn't call it feckless. Um, I mean, at the very least, you could say uh, the U.S. has been at, at the very least husbanding resources for for the critical. Uh, function of deterring a hegemonic bid in, uh, by China in the South China Sea, and that's a very important distinction. It's a, it's the difference between getting involved in in the minor issues um, and expending your power in doing that, and and ensuring that you have the power to to deter China from making a hegemonic bid. That's the real key, because what we are left with today is actually, and and to this gentleman's question over here about about does does the U.S. want to stop China from doing everything in the South China Sea? Of course not. We haven't. Um, but what we are, are left with now is an area of overlapping vital interests, um, vital national interests between the U.S. and China. So now the U.S., is, it's true, now the U.S. needs to um, ensure that its uh, presence in the region remains robust enough to maintain that umbrella, to ensure that the, that, that the freedom uh, uh, of action in the South China Sea for the United States and all states um, remains intact. It's true, but that's the policy going forward so far. China does not have and cannot have sea control throughout the, the South China Sea in all scenarios short of armed conflict with the United States. And now we're going to ask all of you one last time to vote on the proposition China has the capability to control the South China Sea in all scenarios short of war with the United States. And while you're voting, I will say that after Do our- Do I get to vote? Yeah. You don't get to vote. There's no clickers up here. Um, and uh, while you are voting, um, I will uh, remind you that after uh, our brief break, we are going to have uh, a final keynote address in our conference by Admiral Philip Davidson, uh, who, as you all know, is our Indo-Pacific uh, commander. Uh, and uh, he gave his first on the record public speech uh, just under a week ago uh, at a conference in uh, Halifax. And so this is actually his second public address. And although he will not be with us uh, here in person, it will be live. He will be taking questions. And if you have any remaining questions that have been stimulated by this debate, then you can feel free uh, to ask him. So let's look and see where we are. We've gone from um, 55 percent in favor to 43 percent in favor, and we have gone from 42 percent against to 51 percent against. So um, we have sowed some doubt, but we've had a very, very interesting de debate, and I hope that you'll join me in, uh, in thanking Brian Clark and Peter Dutton. <laughs>